welcome to this special discussion on English country estates. Uh, welcome to our audience here of PCD members with us on Zoom uh, and also a broader audience joining us uh, on YouTube. Uh, looking forward to a terrific discussion over the course of the next hour. Um, we will be bringing you um, a discussion with three experts from the area of English uh, country houses. Um, we are going to look at some of the key trends uh, that we're seeing from the sector. Um, in many of the discussions we've recorded since lockdown on real estate, um, we've heard from advisors dealing with clients on Prime Central London that high net worth clients are increasingly investing uh, in the countryside. And we're going to unpack some of those key issues uh, here today. So we're going to take on some of the latest sales and data trends. We're also going to look to the future. We're going to discuss some areas of, of government policy and how that is uh, impacting on landowners, how they diversify. We're going to be talking about all areas uh, of green technology and business as well. We're going to be looking at some of the tax considerations. So we've got a terrific discussion planned for the next um, 45 minutes. In the final 15 minutes of the hour, we're going to say goodbye to our YouTube audience and we're going to do a little bit of networking uh, with our PCD member audience uh, here on Zoom. Um, I'm joined today by Mark Charter from Carter Jonas, from Trist Tristan Ward from BD B BDB Pittmans and Tim Gregory uh, from Safri Chapness. I'm going to bring them all in uh, on the discussion as we move through uh, the next 45 minutes, but I'm going to kick off and open up with uh, Mark Charter. So good morning, Mark. Morning. Morning, David. Um, so it'd be terrific to open up this discussion, Mark, with some of the key trends that you've seen uh, in COVID um, for the country house sector. Yeah, no, absolutely. The country house prices over much of the last decade have lagged behind the main residential market, really. But in the last 12 or so months, it's sort of turbocharged itself and really caught up with sort of price growth in the sort of five to 10% bracket over the last 12 months alone. So, but within that, you know, there are distinct trends. And I think, you know, what we've definitely noticed is not a flight from London. You know, most of the high net worth buyers are retaining their London property. They're utilizing their cash resources. They're leveraging assets. They're taking advantage of cheap money. And, and borrowing and, and really sort of buying the, you know, to take advantage of those cheap funds and hedging against future price growth. Okay, terrific. And are you seeing any regional patterns? Are there certain regions of England that are more buoyant um, than others? What's the trend you'd pick out there? Yeah, I think the trend probably really is reinforcing what we've already seen. So accessible prime locations within easy reach of London is where the strongest growth has been seen. So it's not been the case that buyers are taking advantage of going hours away because they're not going to be as going to London as regularly as they were pre-COVID. So it's, it's really those sort of prime areas, say the Chilterns around Henley and Marlow has seen huge growth with you know, some of the best in class properties there selling at beyond a thousand pounds a square foot. Um, the northern Cotswolds reflecting the, the appeal of the Chipping Norton set is enduring and everlasting. You know, the value that's been added to Cotswold property by Soho Farmhouse is incredible. And, and you know, it's continuing to drive that. You know, there was a 3,000 Clinton estate at Woodstock that traded this winter between Middle Eastern ruling families at between 125 and 150 million. You know, prices that we've never really seen in the English countryside before. Uh, going further away, Bruton in Somerset, you know, again, you know, popular and um, highly visible location that's continued to sort of drive demand. So it's sort of, you know, buyers going to where there are PLUs and DFLs, you know, people like us down from London, they want that comfort of, of knowing, you know, they're going to be in a society where they'll fit in. Are there new international buyers, do you think, coming into the market? I mean, you mentioned there the transaction between Middle Eastern families. Is that something you're observing? You previously would have stuck to London, perhaps, for investment, and now looking at different styles of properties. I, um, I think that was probably a one-off in mm. that respect. There have been some international buyers. You know, there was another estate purchaser, again, highly, highly visible. I can't remember. There was a... Um, a Malaysian Singaporean model, I think, if I remember correctly, buying an estate in Hampshire. But I think you know the English buyer has been the strongest buyer 
by far this last 12 months. It really has been money that's come back to the fore. Is that something you've observed as well around, you know, nationalities and interest? Uh, is there anything to add on that uh, point from Mark? Sorry, David. I was just asking whether Tristan, yeah. did you have anything to add on that? Yes, I, I think that certainly in the estate world, the only international buyers are those who buy into the idea of being the English gentleman. Um, or else they have a particular interest in, say, sport, um, in, in country sports, and they need the English country estate to add to their international portfolio. But they, they're Anglophiles who buy the country estate, I think. Okay, many, many thanks for that. Um, Mark, I mean, uh, perhaps, are, are there any trends around sort of styles of property and characteristics that you're seeing? I mean, we've obviously talked about proximity to London as one factor. Yeah. But on the individual property, what are you seeing as the, the, the essentials given Absolutely. the changing tastes through COVID? Yeah. Um, the Holy Grail, and if you've got one of these, then give me a ring afterwards, please. Um, Georgian proportions, light space, large family dine-in kitchen, 30 acres or so of ground, so enough to give you space and privacy, but you know there are people, as, as Tristan was alluding to, who want the, the shooting estate around it, but for many you know, who are actually moving out of London, actually they just want land to give them sort of privacy and comfort and space to relax into that sort of 30 or so acres would work and, and top spec finish. So if you can unite all of those, then, then you really are in that sort of thousand pound plus a square foot barrier. And some of those, some of the projects we've seen built you know, close to um, sort of London are and nudging two thousand pounds a square foot, you know, sort of London prices, sort of trickling through. Okay, and, and I mean, is the, is the data available pointing to some long term trends, or is it too early to sort of to work that out? Or and you know, more broadly, what do you see as the future? Um, yeah, for the state. Absolutely. So we analyse through this, our sales and valuation work, quite a lot of country house and estate sales and sort of break that data down. So it's not too early. And if I just give a sort of a snapshot over the sort of last five years, there was an estate near Watlington that sold four or five years ago, just over 30 million pound. It's resold, not a lot happened to it, uh, sold north of 40 million. And that was something that ticked, you know, many of those aspects of the Holy Grail that I referred to earlier on. Uh, Country House in Somerset sold in 2017 at 5.85 5 million, sold five and three quarters, sorry, seven and three quarters this year, so 30% growth. Another estate in Hampshire sold in 2018 at seven and a half. They spent three million on it and resold it this year at, at 15. So what we're seeing is, interestingly, sort of pounds per square foot is increasing for the larger the house is. So there's definitely a hunger for larger properties into 15 to 20,000 square foot size, whereas that might have fallen off as houses got bigger sort of 10 or so years ago, but actually people are wanting more space. So they're prepared, paying a premium for it. The other trend is in terms of land, again, sort of the analysis that we've done in the last year is the sort of the premium for really large acreages on country estates has come back. So average values might be eight and a half thousand pounds, nine thousand pounds an acre for sort of normal agricultural land in the UK. But packaging that up within an estate, and if you're in the sort of thousand pound acre bracket, then that value jumps to sort of easily jumps to sort of ten to twelve thousand pounds an acre average. So people are paying for more space, more land where it exists. I mean, Tristan or, or Tim, do you have a perspective on uh, the data that, that uh, Mark has just uh, quoted and, and whether it is part of a longer term uh, pattern rather than a blip uh, due to COVID? I mean, Tristan, what's your, what's your view on that? Um, I, I tell this story quite a lot. Back in 2005, I had two transactions running simultaneously. One of them was in Chelsea for a lovely shoebox, a very large shoebox, and the other was for a country estate in Herefordshire, which had fishing rights, it had 25 cottages. The two were the same price, um, 10 figure sums for both of them. 
my, I've sold the Chelsea one, I would put a pretty good bet on the value of the Herefordshire estate having kept up with the London one. Now, there, there was a big blip in land prices in 2005, Mark, and the financial crisis, yeah. because people floated to land. But I think that's an interesting observation. The other interesting observation I had is that I bought an estate, 3,000 acres in Wiltshire, which had last changed hands in, 28, uh, in 1918 for a six-figure sum. And my client bought it for a 10-figure sum. And out of curiosity, I did a compound interest calculation, which showed that that land had made about 8% a year over not quite a century in mm -hmm. value, which just illustrates that they're not making any more of it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Tim, Tim do, you, do you have any perspective on, on, on these the trends, the sales data, and, and is that ringing true with your um, experience on, on valuation? Sure, it's, 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 it's very interesting that, that to, to hear Mark say that, um, that, that, that people will pay more, more per square foot um, for, for, the, for the next square foot than, than for the last one, and, and that doesn't, doesn't seem to have a limit. Uh, clearly, it must have a limit somewhere. Um, but um, but but it's interesting that that at the sorts of sorts of size of size of country house that um, that, that, that we're talking about, um, people are prepared to pay more and more and more for for, for a bigger and bigger house, um, you know, proportionally speaking, um, and that's that that's very intriguing. Um, so so uh, an in, in interesting interesting sort of trend. Thanks, and uh, Mark, um, looking at some of the practical steps that estate and landowners are taking now to anticipate some of the changes in policy. We're going to get into that in a bit more detail with Tristan shortly, but what are you seeing from the practical steps um, from, from this area? Yeah, um, I think COVID has probably passed most to stay by um, in respect of their traditional sort of day-to-day -day operations. Um, but as you were alluding to, and as Tristan will sort of expand the detail, we're at the cusp of sort of very significant shifts in, in public policy and public influence. The transition away from... EU subsidy regime to UK government, agri and environment support programmes will put a different slant on it. Um, my sense is that landowners are looking at their tenancies and how that mosaic of uses and occupations can be repurposed. Um, I think there's going to be a stronger partnership between landowners and the, their farmer, farmer tenant, farmer occupiers, as they seek revenue from uh, environmental and carbon related grants. I think you'll see more tree planting to take advantage of grants and opportunities to capitalize upon carbon sequestration. You, know, you have to remember sort of lower value land in the extremities of the UK has the same carbon sequestration potential, um, but is a third of the cost. Um, so I think, you know, I think the fear, equally the fear of reducing incomes for agriculture could be overstated. A 10% swing in commodity prices will more than make up for a 50% cut in subsidy. And you know, in the last couple of years, we've seen more than a 10% swing in the price of a ton of wheat. Um, so you know, I think we'll see further increasing diversification um, and a dilution of the reliance on agriculture for income, I suspect. And, and how do you see land being let um, occupied, let or farmed in this future picture. What, what's your what's your what's your sense there? Yeah, um, I think the renting of farms by a farmer from a landowner um, will become ever more sort of fractured, um, sort of greater separation of houses and buildings from the land. Uh, and in, but equally, I think there'll be an increasing partnership between the landowner and farmer. So. You, uniting all the elements that you see on the estate, you know, the land, woodland, water, air, to maximise the income benefits for each party. You know, the money is not going to follow dirt for crop production in the future, so they will have to partner up their assets um, to provide those holistic benefits back to the public. Okay, thanks. And I mean, Tristan, do you, do you have any thoughts there responding to Mark's uh, view, view of the future? Is it in line with that way that you see the future for the way that land is managed? Um, I think 
I'm beginning to think of people as land managers rather than farmers. Um, the primary use of land has always in certainly in the UK for yeah, as certainly for 200 years has been growing stuff. Whether growing stuff will be so important in terms of creating the income, as Mark says, remains to be seen. I think Tim um, will tell us either now or later about the tax drivers around occupation, um, which are going to have to be taken into account in a way you know, traditionally, it's been quite easy if you you inherit you think about inheritance tax a lot. How that fits into the new uses, so as to maximise inheritance tax relief as long as it survives, is something that will drive the occupational things a lot. Um, Unless, of course, we move away from a model that is about handing things down from generation to generation. Okay, thanks. I mean, Tim, do you, do you have any thoughts there? We're going to get into detail on some of the tax issues uh, later on. But um, in terms of just the vision of the future for country estates, what is it that you see at a headline level? Uh, from sure, 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 absolutely. So we'll talk about tax a bit later. But, um, but, but, but certainly, I, I, I see the, the, the larger landowners... Uh, by which I don't I don't mean the gigantic ones, but 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 um, but significantly bigger than the sorts of, sorts of size that, that Mark was talking about earlier, sort of sort of a house plus thirty acres. I'm talking about sort of thousand acre plus. Um, I think will 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 need to um, be bigger and bigger um, in, in order to take best advantage of, of things. And, and I think the smaller owners, by which I mean perhaps your sort of hundred to three hundred acre farm, which has always been under under un, under threat and, uh, in terms of um, in term, terms of viability, I, I think that that sort of ownership is, is going to be less and less. And so, so, so the smaller owners are going to be packing up, um, by, by, by which I mean that sort of size. Um, interesting that Mark says that, that there's a lot of demand for your sort of house plus 30 acres. And I think that that might be where, where things go. Um, obviously, there's a limit to, to, to how, how, how an estate can be split up into that, that sort of size, bearing in mind planning restrictions on principal houses and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, um, but, but clearly, there's going to be a, going to be a, a trend towards, towards um, uh, rewilding, for example, um, and, um, and various other environmental sorts, sorts of, sorts, sorts of uh, um, initiatives um, encouraged by government policy. And, and I think, as, as Mark perhaps slightly alluded to earlier, um, that that's going to lead to owners needing to take more control of what's going on in their land and perhaps leading to more tenanted farmland being taken in hand um, so that they have more of that control and can control where the income streams from the environmental um, uh, uh, in inducements are, are actually going. Um, it, it, it's, it's very interesting to, 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 to hear, um, well, to read in the press fairly recently that um, the lead singer of Coldplay went on record as saying that um, he wasn't going to, or he and his band were not going to arrange any more tours until they could demonstrate that they were carbon neutral. So they were going to be looking at, at, uh, at, at investing in, um, in, uh, um, in um, tree planting. Um, so that they could be carbon neutral, and uh, and 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 that's an interesting sort of sort of sort of, sort of aspect. I mean, clearly, all businesses are, are going to be pushed towards this sort of approach in, in due course. Um, but uh, interesting, we're being 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 led by the pop stars on that. Absolutely, and does put pressure on others, doesn't it, to look at how they're uh, operating their affairs when you have such high profile cases? Um, mm. Just to come to you on to, to get into some detail on the policy issues. I mean, how do you see COVID and indeed Brexit as as impacted owners of English country estates um, and and the rural economy at a macro level? Is that for me, David, or is that for bring Tristan back in there on some of the policy? Yeah. Um... It, we all, we, we're all sick and tired of the B word. It matters. The, I think the trade figures for January were very instructive. Um, January 2020, our exports of food to the EU went down by 75%. 
whereas our exports to non-EU countries went down by a fraction over 10%. Beef went down by over 19% uh, January to January, and animal feed went down by 80%. Some of that, of course, is stockpiling and teething problem, problems and so on. But those are big numbers as well. So it may be that things are being diverted, but the fall in imports was very much less. And we, there, is more, there are more frictions on trade to come uh, because the checking periods, the grace periods are not yet expired um, for some agri-products. And that is going to be a challenge to those parts of the food industry that export. And that is going to have to be made up from somewhere. And the way in which we see it being made up is the shifting of cash, as Mark said earlier, from the common agricultural policy on the one hand, to government's um, stated aim, the strap line is, of course, as everybody here will know, is public goods for public money. And I also think there will be private opportunities here where people who want to do good to the environment, be that for market-driven reasons, for policy-driven reasons, because they have to, for market reason, big driven reasons because they think they can make money out of it, or for um, more social reasons, corporate responsibility type reasons, philanthropy type, type reasons. Land is a massive resource for public good. And we're all reading about natural capital and ecosystem services. What are the things the natural world provides to us that today are outside the balance sheet, but perhaps should come onto the balance sheet so that we can get market signals about how to improve, how to prevent damage to the environment at stage one, and then repair damage to the environment that has been done stage two and stage three, even improve the environment. And we're seeing, I think, some very interesting practical examples of that happening on a day-to-day -day basis um, outside government policy, but also in government policy as well. Um, one thing that got some headlines was the requirement to increase biodiversity by 10% on any planning consent. Now, a developer who plows up a big greenfield site, a thousand acre greenfield site for, um, uh, for, for, for a large bunch of houses is going to find it very difficult to increase biodiversity on that site. And so somebody is going to have to give it to him. And that is an opportunity for landowners, land managers, not only to make that land available, but also to be paid for managing it. And the measures that can be taken can be, you know, it can be very simple. Mark talked about planting trees. There's one. It can be even simpler. You can put in, you can start increasing your hedgerows. You can start taking your land out of production, but somebody will have to pay you a cost, the cost of managing it. Even trees don't just grow if you're going to do them properly, um, then they will need to be managed and someone's going to have to do it, and that means somebody can make money out of it. And that provides an income stream for a long time over these estates. And these estates traditionally have long time horizons, so they can take these kind of time long, you know, 100 uh, year periods into account without any trouble at all. Um, another exciting example is um, going on around the Solent at the moment. Again, many of you, many of our listeners will be familiar with it, where the planners are very concerned about nitrogen going into the water tables and into the Solent. New houses produce effluent, effluent produces nitrogen, that nitrogen needs to go somewhere. And the planners are saying, well, you, you need to take steps to 
make sure that the nitrogen burden doesn't, doesn't increase. And so developers are today going out and buying up farmland or arranging with land managers to say, you will not put nitrogen fertilizer on your land anymore. That nitrogen won't go into the water table. Bingo, we have created the solution that unlocks our planning permission. So those are, those are very interesting, I think, ways of changing the market in a way that prevents degradation to the environment and potentially improves it as well. Hmm. Do you think these sort of new income streams and area, new markets almost that are being developed um, will lead to a reinvestment and resurgence in, in, in larger estates? Are we going to see um, you know, a rejuvenation of, of, of properties and estates that perhaps without these markets and new income streams might be neglected or overlooked? I think there's, there, there are opportunities for people. I, sus, I doubt there will be, I doubt there will be people going around buying up land and hoarding it to make it available in due course. Um, Mark, no doubt, will have views on that. Where I think the investment is going to come is on is. is on the very exciting high tech side and um, that's in, um, the, the, the of describing it some people say that gene editing I think correctly is just another kind of genetic manipulation which the EU um, is, is unlawful in the EU um, it is also possible to argue that certainly as it currently stands gene editing technologies make very minor changes to DNA. You don't bring in enormous lengths of DNA uh, that more fundamentally change the underlying genome. You just bring in, at the moment, very small bits. And certainly the consultation is proceeding on the basis that only, quote, natural changes, close quote, will be permitted. Um, the idea being that you are able to manipulate the genome, in a way that reflects naturally occurring, um, naturally occurring mutations so that you will be able to speed up traditional breeding. But there's a debate going on about that. But I think an awful lot of money will go into that. An awful lot of money will go into robotics, drones, um, robots that pick raspberries for you instead of people who do it. Uh, I think we'll all be familiar with precision farming, the ability to put a tractor exactly where you want it onto a field to within two inches and to put exactly the right amount of fertilizer onto it, not just sort of put an extra bag in the back of a back of a fertilizer spreader where you get to the difficult bit. You can be far more precise, and you're actually recreating the the land manager's sort of traditional knowledge of every inch of his or her field, which which is which is a really exciting thing. So I think there'll be a lot of work done there. I think that the you can see um, everybody on the call will look at LinkedIn. Certainly, my LinkedIn feed is full of people advertising exciting new farming technologies and opportunities. Um, and then there's diversification. And at one level, you know, diversification has always gone on. My family, we diversified by converting our traditional farm buildings back in the 80s. Um, we, put it, we put in leisure. But diversification covers a lot of, you know, a lot of bases. Traditionally, it's been leisure. Country sports are just another kind of diversification, really. There's the exploitation of redundant buildings and repurposing. And I think some of the things that we've been talking about around ecosystem services are just a, another kind of diversification, exciting new income streams that entrepreneurial landowners and land managers will be able to exploit. Okay, thanks. I mean, I mean, perhaps, uh, Mark, is, are you seeing any acceleration in trends and diversification? Or as Tristan said, it's something that's been going on for a long time um, and, you know, it's just part of an ongoing trend. What's your view? Yeah. 
No, it, it has been going on a long time. You know, it de definitely has. I suppose the two things that we've seen this year are people looking at whether there's areas of land they can buy for tree planting and whether they can make the numbers for stack up. And that's large areas of land. And as I said, that's sort of outside of the prime southeast, really, um, and going into the sort of Wales, north of England and Scotland and sort of quite large areas of land for tree planting, carbon sequestration purposes. The other one, which you know, I think we're all going to need by the sounds of it this summer, is, is pop-up glamping operations. So we've got a whole host of those on estates and farms where we're putting agreements in place with operators under the sort of 56-day permitted development rule for pop-up glamping. And, and that will be interesting in terms of the extent to which that is a one-off this year or it becomes a trend in terms of, you know, not to say staycation, but sort of short breaks. So, you know, an increase in short break weekends, mini breaks in the UK in that sort of country environment. You know, is this the start of that sort of a 10 year, 10 year, 20 year sort of growth area? Um, Tim, I mean, I think I think there's been a, there's been a, 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 a policy catalyst really, hasn't there, in, in terms of diversification? I, I trust and absolutely right say, say that diversification has been going on for a, a long long time but um but the policy catalyst that i'm i'm referring to is, is is the announcement of the termination some years ago now termination of the basic payment scheme and and and, and european wide subsidies and then of course a double catalyst um brexit and and at the time that bps this big payment scheme was was um, was was being looked at in, ter in terms of terms of being terminated um, there were lots of statistical analyses showing that many, many, many farms um, survived solely because of the subsidy that they that they received. That, you know, any any profit that they made was equal to, uh, or, or or possibly even less than um, the subsidy that they received. And so that 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 caused people to to take a sort of a, a, a further a further step in, th in thinking, well, you know, I've, I've actually got to do something else. And, um, and and with Brexit too, um, and 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 the announcements of, of the UK government to, to do what they're going to do um, does just force people into it. I, I think there is, there is very much a, a, a faster trend towards diversification than there has been in in recent years. Thanks, and Tristan. I, I think it's worth picking up here on what government policy is, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think I mentioned before public goods for public money, and public goods we immediately sort of naturally think of biodiversity, we think of cultural heritage, but it also includes uh, enabling the public to enjoy the countryside. And that will tie in to the, the glamping, the walking, the camping, the, uh, the leisure activities that I think are going to be in many ways, some of the very easiest ways of diversification, how far it will stretch to the, you know, the, the numerous wedding venues that we've, we've seen over the last few years, I think is another question. Um, but uh, I, I think that that is part enabling, enabling the, the, the owners to exploit their assets is, does seem to be very much part of the uh, part of the mantra, how far in a world where public debt is piling up, um, where there are enormous demands, you know, from ev everybody wants to put its hands into the government's pocket and take a bit, how far there will be money available for some of these things that are effectively enabling people to make money out of the out of the public enjoying the countryside how much that money will be available will be will remains to be seen um, in my opinion but the policy is there um, it does it tend it's it, it does though it, it, it's extending more widely than um, the biodiversity as well it extends to livestock uh, plants and animal health it extends to soil health um, and going back to the genetics thing, it actually includes um, perhaps this. This does sound to me a bit odd. It does include livestock and plant genetics as well. Is in there under the uh, under the public good for public gain, uh, public um, benefit, public money for public benefit 
mantra. Um, but so it, it, there's a big set of areas where government will be bringing money forward, um, probably on a competitive basis, the way it is likely to work, and Mark will correct me if I get this wrong, I'm sure, is that landowners and not just landowners, but probably landowners, will have to bring forward projects. And whoever it is who decides where the money goes will decide which projects are most worthy. And, and the basis, as I understand it, on the way that those are going to work will be a basis that we are collectively very familiar with. It's essentially a contract between government and the land occupier that says, if you do this, that, and the other, which is the public good, then you will get money for it. Uh, and that just extends the model that has been running since the original countryside stewardship ooh, two decades ago. Um, so, uh, so, so the, the concept of the way it will work will, will be easy for everybody to understand, I think. It's just that the way in which the detail works out will be different. And in terms of incentives, you know, generally, I mean, uh, what, what are the sort of key incentives motivating um, shifts in behaviour, adopting new practices, um, what, what's the sort of rundown of, of new incentives that are there for people? Sorry, for, for Tristan. For me, um, I think the, the, the way people, I think there are, there are two kinds of landowners really, there are the people who want to do the best for the land, and the old saying is, farm, what is it, uh, for, uh, live as if you're going to die tomorrow, farm as if you're going to live forever. Um, getting that land properly looked after and handing it on to the next generation, whoever the next generation may be, is always very important. Um, and on top of that, there comes the, you know, the wish to... The, the, the wish to live in a nice place, the wish that you are, you live in a nice environment. And yes, in many cases, to make sure that that environment is available to others too. You also have to make a living out of it. It has to wash its face. And certainly the my ultra high net worth clients will always be interested in the land washing its face. Those who own it for making a living out of it have a much more direct um, uh, uh, interest in making money because if it doesn't, if they don't succeed, their business fails and it hurts them. It hurts their self-respect tremendously uh, to lose what your what your family has had for generations is a painful thing. Um, and then you look about you as to how are you going to make the money out of it. And if you are well advised, I think at the moment you have a new, you know, there are a lot of opportunities out there. We haven't talked about renewable energy, for example. Um, I was talking to um, the head of renewable energy at one of the well-known estate agents yesterday. You can pick up a thousand pounds an acre for a, renew for a solar farm. Now, if you've got 50 acres, which is I think a reasonably sized solar farm, and you get the typical 25 year lease, that's 12 and a half million pounds spread over a 25 year period. And with that, you, you can do something. Thank you. Um, I mean, Mark, do you see renewables being an increasing part of the mix? Um, do you have a perspective on that? Yes, absolutely. It, 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 it's interesting. They, they wax and wane over the years in terms of viability or profitability of different sectors, but certainly solar is is back on the agenda and viable um, in ever sort of increasing acreages and seems to be you know, more acceptable in a planning context now than it was perhaps 10 or 15 years ago when there was probably greater public resistance in your, your local neighbourhood if you were bringing forward a solar scheme. So yes, in, in my part of Oxfordshire, you know, there's, there's been you know, a number of very large solar projects that are that are coming on stream and coming through the planning system that perhaps 10 or 15 years ago you'd have really struggled to get those off the ground. Okay thanks I mean Tim is that something you're seeing as well an increased interest in, in renewables or? Um... 
implementation? Oh, ab 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 absolutely. I mean, and was it sort of two, two, two or three plus four, four, four years ago? There was definitely a drop off because because the the the, uh, the government subsidies around it um, were, were cut. But uh, but it's very much come back again. Um, and I mean, perhaps just just moving on to tax. Mm, yeah. Specifically in the context in the context of renewables, I mean, one of the things that uh, that, that is that is available to to any any owner of the state. I was talking about larger states earlier, but if, if we talk about just just the sort of thirty acre thirty acre plus house um, type thing that Mark was talking about earlier, renewable energy is ab absolute, absolutely there 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 for everyone. Perhaps not a, a, a gigantic fifty acre field with with with, uh, with solar panels in, but there'll be something of that nature. And a corporate environment for a, for a renewable energy opportunity is often the best thing to do for tax purposes because you get better um, exposure to capital allowances, for example, um, and so, so 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 you get a get a get a strong, stronger uh, strong, stronger write off in, in in your in your early years, um, and a lower tax environment for the for the profits as well. Um, at nineteen percent currently, um, as we've heard recently in the, from the Chancellor's budget, it's going to go up to twenty five percent. There is a there is a sting in that. In, in that it wants to get money out and to extract profits from a corporate environment, you're, you're going to end up paying more tax overall, especially with that increase of 25% um, than you would do if you had it owned directly. But it does provide you with a with a with with a, with a sort of a, 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 a warehouse for build for accumulating profits and perhaps using those profits on on something something else within the company, perhaps another renewable energy project. Um, very very uh, very useful. And does that apply as well for property and land? Is the co corporate vehicles are, are the main ways of structuring? What, what's your on well? It's, it's interesting. I, a few years ago, it would, be the, it would be the worst thing to do uh, it, a, a corporate structure. It was sort of ten to, up until about maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, trusts were were the were the classic way to structure your ownership um, and be able to pass things down down the generations. It's really hard now though to do anything clever with the whole ownership. I mean, there are one or two opportunities. And especially there are opportunities to tinker with existing structures and create good, efficient new structures for specific activities like like renewable renewable energy project. Um, but um, but to, to look to look at the whole, or at least a large part of the whole, um, many many listeners to this call will be aware of what's what's known as Balfour planning, um, where, where you where you create I, I'd either create a, a, a specific entity, perhaps a partnership, or or just look to corral. Um, um, various various ownerships in, into one one sort of management unit, um, and seek to um, seek, seek to, to to ensure that the trading aspect of that of, of that um, entity um, is at least fifty percent of the of, of, of the whole. Um, what that does is um, is is uh, secure business business property relief from inheritance tax, and uh, and, and that, that's that's very attractive indeed. Um, there is talk, though, of um, of that 50-50 um, uh, requirement moving to an 80-20 requirement. So you'd have to have 80% trading. And, and again, going back to the context of perhaps a house with 30 acres, it's going to be very difficult to see how how you could get uh, how, how you could get 80% trade um, of, of of anything that goes on in, in a holding of that size. But 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 with a larger estate, yes, perhaps that's possible. So is that reform about you know? Uh, changes to inheritance tax relief because it is a, a, a useful, generous relief. So it's being tightened because the exchequer's need to collect tax and to disqualify more of the estates. Is that is that your read on it? Are, th are there likely to be further reforms or further tightening of conditions? Well, I mean, there's been talk about tight tightening of of, uh, of of inheritance tax um, again and again and again for for for, for years and years and years, decades. Uh, I'd say, and uh, and I would say that there are there are no no, 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 extensive um, real changes on the immediate horizon, but but with this 80-20 point and, and uh, as compared to 50-50 point uh, um, in mind, um, reform is clearly on the agenda. I just um, just just yesterday I, I I read something I didn't did, didn't catch the full detail, but um, but but either the government or the treasury or HMRC or someone has um, have, have sort of put their support. Um, behind the most recent consultation in relation to IHT reliefs, and and and, and that involves things like that sort of eighty twenty test, um, abolition of um, CGT free uplift on death, which which is a which is a very um, significant help in terms of succession planning from from one generation to the next, um, has an impact on interspouse transfers too. There was one one good thing about that consultation though, which was which was the possibility of reducing the seven year tail on um, on inheritance tax gifts. Um, but there's lot, lot, lots, 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 
lots of possibilities going on. Um, it's just a question really of seeing, seeing if and when um, any, any current government might, um, might grasp onto it. But I suspect that around about now is, 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 is one of the times that's most likely to happen because the government have got an awful lot of tax to raise mm. um, to, to, to pay what they've, what they've borrowed during this COVID environment. And so we might well see some changes there. Okay, we heard from Tristan around public money for public goods agenda. I mean, how does that affect the ownership structure? Um, of those uh, activities, on from a tax perspective. Well, I, I'd say it, com it comes back to, um, to, 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 to some extent, to um, trying to get ownership back in hand, um, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, it's interesting, actually, to, to think about whether whether supporting public goods um, is is something that, um, that that should be available for tax relief purposes, and that's an interesting debating point. Um, whether, whether, whether you can whether, whether that, that, that should uh, uh, benefit from from inheritance tax reliefs or indeed other capital tax reliefs various various tax reliefs um, so uh, so that's that's an interesting interesting point and one one thought that um, that that one might have um, is that bearing in mind that if, if you have a, a, a tract of land that um, that is going to be put into the sort of public goods um, category um, and um, is it do, does does that does that massively reduce its value, and if it does, um, then thinking about the long term succession of the ownership of that piece of land, um, would it be worth um, perhaps um, uh, granting a lease of that land to some other trust, perhaps even a charitable trust, bearing in mind um, the public benefit that would be taken from it? Is it is it possible to to constitute a charitable purpose of that land? Um, grant that lease to that charity or, or, or some other entity for say 50 years plus, and you have a, a, a materially reduced value in, in the freehold and pass that freehold down to the next generation or to a trust for the generation after that, or even one after that um, with, um, with very little um, capital tax implication. So that, um, so, so that when, when that lease comes to an end, it, it, the, 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 the the whole ownership reverts to um, to to a generation that might be three three generations away from now. Uh, th those sorts of things are, are are up in the air and and and, and be possible. We don't know yet, but um, there's there's always opportunity to look at. So interesting opportunities there because I mean succession planning in general. Um, I'd imagine there's lots of of difficulties as you mentioned. Trusts are more difficult to plan uh, to use to plan for succession. Estates might be not be, uh, be a bit cash strapped so that they're not able to buy big insurance contracts to mitigate any any liabilities there might be capital gains tax considerations to think about um but what are the sort of what are the sort of typical things that people are looking at outside as we're saying structuring these new holdings in an efficient way is there anything particular they're looking at well i mean trusts as i mentioned are increasingly a thing of the past i, I would say they do still work in certain circumstances um, I mean, particularly if you've got um, if, if you've got land that qualifies for agricultural property relief, um, or, or indeed if you're looking at a business with with, with business property relief, um, then um, then 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 using trusts for succession planning still works. Absolutely, still works, and is and is is, is a very very, uh, very 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 acceptable thing to be doing. I mentioned Balfour planning, um, creating that that sort of that, that sort of environment where where at least uh, at least half of the activity qualifies as trading. Um, but someone picked up earlier on, on, the, on, on the use of corporates, and I mentioned that for, for specific purposes. It, it, is, it, it is also useful for the entire ownership of the estate, especially where you can create um, different classes of shares um, and, and allocate those different classes of shares to perhaps different generations within the family. Um, there may be higher tax charge overall, especially if you're trying to get income out of the company. Um, but uh, but 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 uh, but it, but it, it's 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 a way to uh, to to um, to pass ownership down the generations while still having the main generation in de facto control of what's of, of what's going on. Um, I mean, pe people on this call may re may recognise what I'm talking about as a family investment company, which are traditionally just used for liquid investments. But but there are ways of of, of dealing dealing with it for for a, for, a, for an estate. Okay, thank you. Well, we're going to uh, shortly, we're going to just go to our, our breakout rooms. I'll just come for a quick closing comment uh, to Tristan uh, and Mark and Tim. So Tristan, do you have a closing comment as we wrap up this uh, conversation? Um, 
I, I don't think I've got anything profound to say. There are other than there are challenges and the challenges bring opportunities. Um, I do think that it, it, those, the Farmers Weekly about a year ago wrote an editorial effectively saying to farmers, shape up or get out. Uh, and I think that advice is probably as wise as ever. Um, the kind of clients we are talking about have a bit more, ha have, have more fuel in the tank, have more reserves, more buffers than, than some. I wouldn't care to be, you know, a dairy farmer on 300 acres in the southwest right now. But they've stood there. They need to grasp these opportunities. OK, thank you. Um, Mark, any, any closing comments to wrap up this discussion? Now, I, I think building on what Tristan was saying, you know, where we're at, and I'm alluded to, we're sort of a cusp of a, a time of great change. And you know, I think there's going to be a shift from farmers producing crops to the owners of land doing other things and you know the, the the demographic or age profile of much of the farming community you know is is you know is quite old you know the the average is sort of well into the sort of 60s and 70s so i think you know the next 10 years will will see a lot of consolidation and change and opportunities for those in the sector and new owners coming into the sector as, as, as land and sort of farming opportunities get traded and, and switched around. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tim, any closing comments we're up on the session? I, th I think, I think keep, keep in mind your ownership structure. When these sorts of opportunities arise, opportunities and changes and challenges and, and threats and weaknesses and everything else, whenever, whenever these arise, they, 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 change, they change the environment um, in which you're operating. And that might, might, change the structure that you that, that you are best placed to have um, something that suited you best for, for the for the past 10 20 30 years um, might well not be suitable for, for the coming 10 20 years or what it might be and equally true for someone who's who's buying in for the first time um, don't don't use the, the the sorts of the sorts of structuring that um, that have been traditionally used for the last 10 20 30 years you use something that's going to work for the future okay well thank you uh, thank you for joining us today we're going to go off to our break